I'd like you to turn them over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 11 through 21. Paul's never-ending stresses. And we can all concur with that statement. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to read starting in verse 11. And if you would follow along with me as I read to the end of the chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. I have been a fool. You forced me to it, for I ought to have been commended by you, for I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. For in what you were less favored than the rest of the churches, except I myself did not burden you. Forgive me this wrong. Here for the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours, but you. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? But granting that I myself did not burden you, I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit. Did I take advantage of you through any of those whom I send to you? I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did he not act in the same spirit? Did we not take the same steps? Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ, and all for your upbuilding, beloved. For I fear that perhaps when I come I may find not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may, may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again by my God may humble me before you, and that I might have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. And Father, again, we are truly blessed to have your word today, and truly blessed to have each other here, God. And so now we are asking that you might fill us with your spirit as your word goes forth, may it be brought forth in the power of the spirit and to bring about understanding to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. For the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at some of the things that Paul expressedly spoke about concerning his dilemma, his tribulations, his trials and difficulties in life. And I got to tell you, as I look at his resume, I'm thinking there's no part of that I would really desire. But nevertheless, as Paul endured such great sufferings, and trials and testings. In some way, we can look at that today in our lifestyles or in our culture, and we can say, you know what, I can in some way sympathize with some of these things, but not necessarily empathize with everything that he went through. But for the most part, you know, it's really difficult when, especially as someone who loves the people of God, and of course, as much as he invested his time with these individuals, he desperately wanted them to walk with God. Because of their, lo their lives and because of their apathy and mediocre lifestyle and because they were so susceptible to false teachers and false doctrine, uh, and it was kind of like this. As the church was established, it was open doors to anyone who wanted to come in. And so as these false teachers, which were unbeknown to them at the time, began to advance in some of the critical areas in leadership, it was not long before they began having a persuasive effect on many of the people's hearts. And so in an attempt uh, to say they were followers of Christ, but all the while their motives were, of course, of the, the baser sort of kind of life, the false teachers, were wooing and leading these people astray into false doctrine. 
And, and Paul was caught in the mix of it because they began to turn against Paul. Now you can imagine someone you love dearly turn against you. For really for no reason at all. I mean, it would have been one thing if Paul would have been stealing. It would have been one thing if Paul would have been murdering. It would have been one thing if Paul would have been lying about them and doing all the things he discussed here at the end of this chapter. However, there was not one thing they could accuse him of. All the while, the false teachers began and continually began or continually wanted to divide and conquer this congregation or these congregations to do what? To exploit them. But Paul was on to them. And so that's the reason he's writing this letter, on well, these two letters. Actually, maybe it's been th a third letter, uh, to correct the abuses, to correct the sinfulness of these uh, Christian, these immature Christians. A junior school teacher said to the Katera class, Boys and girls, I want you to follow the wonderful example of the ant. Every day the ant goes to work and works all day. Every day the ant is busy. And in the end, what happens? Little Johnny shouted, someone steps on him. And you know, as Paul was wanting to relate to these individuals the, 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 the calling and the will of God for their lives, they didn't want any part of Paul. And which, again, it didn't make much sense. Paul wanted nothing but the best for them. And so he had to endure quite a bit of difficulties as a result and trials as a result of wanting to live for God and to instruct them on how they should be accountable to their God as well. Well, we have a three-point message here this morning, and we want to see how he responded as an apostle. Remember, uh, Paul the apostle had... Um, Again, walk with God for a number of years. And so God placed on him a huge responsibility in carrying out the commission of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only to his own people, but God chose him to be the gospel messenger for the Gentiles as well, which is us. Well, Paul was unyielding despite obstacles. And sometimes that could be said of anyone who's on fire for the things of God. Let me just say this. I believe every believer should be on fire for the things of God, without exception. Now, the fire I'm talking about is not the fire that you warmed yourself with by this morning or the heating element or whatever that is. We're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So as an apostle, he stood firm against his adversaries despite his weaknesses and trials. Now, again, to even consider that in the day in which he's living. Now, you know, it's the same thing today. Yeah, maybe you hadn't seen that. Maybe you have. But, you know, I noticed that in our elections, in our electoral process, the person who's running for office, it depends on the office that he's running for or she's running for, the more authoritative they are, the more acceptable they are. It doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter, you know, for instance, uh, we're not talking about looks and we're not talking about, uh, you know, other, other things. But for the most part, if that person comes across as authoritative, in other words, I'm making demands. And even though they may be right, and even though they may be even wrong, that person who comes across as that authoritative is the person they're going to select. If you notice that. Well, Paul here, on the other hand, even in their day, the Greeks prided themselves, the Romans prided themselves on power and authoritative speech. Paul was saying, I'm, you know what? I stutter when I speak. I'm not the best looking person, but you know what? In Romans, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, he says, I am what I am by what? Now, you know those powerful Greeks and those powerful Romans, they want no part of that. He wanted somebody who was authoritative. Those false teachers came across in that dynamic. And so it was very pulling and very attractive to these immature Christians. But let's just back up a few verses. And for the sake of what the context is all about, Paul begins in chapter 12, verse 1. He says, If I'm, I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. So he understood that if he's going to glory in anything, it was going to be in Jesus Christ alone. And he says, 
I will go on visions and revelations of the Lord. Again, that was not his practice, unlike the false teachers. They prided themselves on the books they wrote. They prided themselves on their big salary. They prided themselves on their, uh, you know, their real opulent speaking and that kind of thing, a, a, a real flowery language. He says, no, not with me. What you see is what it is, the grace of God. And he goes on, I know a man in Christ. He's talking about himself. He wouldn't even use the language about talking in the first person. He talks about in the third person, and that was himself. He says, I, go, I know a man in Christ for 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body. I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body. I do not know. God knows. Boy, that would have been the perfect time to write a book, huh? Perfect time to make a million dollars, sell a million copies, be the number one bestseller of all times. And here he is not laying any claim to that. And then he says, the only person that really knows for sure what happened here is God. And then verse 4, and he says, and, and he heard these things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. See, God told him not to say anything. Verse 5, on behalf of this man, I will boast, but not on my own behalf, and I will not boast except of what? My weaknesses. That doesn't sound like somebody who's authoritative, does it? Although God granted him the power to lift the dead. God granted him the power to heal. Now, and, and in this course, of course, in this given situation, remember, Paul was also, as we're going to continue reading, reading here, he was afflicted by this thorn. And nobody knows what it is, except that it was a messenger from Satan. Now, if I had that authority, and I had that power, again, to boast about, don't you think I could have gotten rid of that thorn? Don't you think I could have gotten rid of that disease and healed myself? Well, let's go on. He says, though, if I should should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. See, the false teachers thought different. Boasters think different. People who want to draw attention to themselves think different. Verse 7, so to keep me from being too Elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Now remember, it wasn't because of something he did that was wrong. So get that clear. Because sometimes people think that because they're being harassed or because they're having a bad hair day or because of some things in their life that shouldn't be there, it's only because of the consequences of sin. Amen, Brother Tony? But you know, that's exactly what we do sometimes. We think that, you know, these things are happening in my life because of, you know, well, I'm just, just being a good person. Paul said, no, no, no. The reason why God sent that, and remember, who sent it? God. God sent that to do what? To keep him from being proud, boastful, arrogant. Verse number 8. Three times, notice, I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Now I really believe Paul poured his heart out before the Lord. It wasn't just, Lord, take this away. I don't think it was one of these little brief moments. I really believe he sincerely got on his face before the Lord and asked God to take that away from him. Whatever that was. As severe as that must have been. But notice the response from the Lord. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, right about then and there, I probably would have had a little, just a little communication here. And I said, Lord, I can't use that. Give me something more powerful than just grace. Because I'm not too thrilled about weakness. After all, this crowd we're discussing here, the ones that are back here in Corinth, they're some ruthless people. They stop at nothing to destroy the life and the character of the Apostle Paul. And yet what? What does God tell him? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect and weakness. It just doesn't make sense. 
It goes against the grain, the culture, the belief system of this world. The world wants no part of this. We're supposed to be operating from authority, power, status, money, power. See? Therefore, notice, as a result of God speaking to him about this, he didn't start complaining. He never once complained here. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of what? Of my weaknesses. Oh, no, Paul. You're going to say that again? Why? Why are you going to keep doing that, Paul? So that, that's the end result, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You notice where he's transitioning. He's transitioning away from himself onto the only one who could sustain him in life. Jesus Christ. Now verse 10, for the sake of Christ, then I am content. That's a big word. With what? Again, weaknesses, <laughs> insults, hardships, persecution, calamities. For when I am what? Weak, I am what? Then strong. See, it's just taking the focus off of you and putting on the one who's all-powerful. Jesus Christ is all-powerful. There's no authority more powerful than him. He possesses all authority. Everything must go under his watchful eye. He is the creator God. He is the omnipotent one. All-powerful God. And Paul's not ashamed to admit that. See, he's transitioning away from him unto the only one who can sustain him. And now he's dealing with these difficult Christians, to say the least, who wanted to live their life the way they saw they should live it, and they wanted to live it without God. All the while they say, well, I got Jesus and I can eat my cake too. I can do like, I can live the life I want to live, and then, you know what, who cares? But Paul desperately cared. Why? Because they, they were under the influence of these shysters, these hucksters, these people who were exploiting them. And they had no clue. All they knew was these people came with a, they just innocently crept in. They began rubbing with the sheep. And before you know it, they're sitting in authoritative positions, leading people astray. Well, the word patience here, as we're going to read here in verse, as we read already, Paul in verse um, 11, he says, I have been a fool. You forced me to it, for I ought to have been commended by, by you, for I was not at all feared to these super apostles. Super apostles were the false teachers. He says, even though I am nothing. See, he didn't Paul didn't think of himself. Now, I know some people say, well, he had a self-esteem problem. No, 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 no. No, he didn't have a self-esteem problem. Paul just looked into the glorious face of Jesus Christ and he said, all of life is in him. In, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you don't have to turn out, I'll, I'll turn in and read it to you. Chapter 2, verses uh, 1 through 5. And when he wrote this first letter, listen to what he says. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaim to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, eloquency. For I decided to know nothing among you except what? Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. And him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Again, doesn't sound like an apostle. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration, notice, of the Spirit and of power. That your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but what? In the power of God. Paul didn't want to draw attention to himself. He could. He could have been just like those false teachers. Hey, boy, that would have been a great time to build a mega church. That's not what his interests were. Who was he pointing to? Jesus Christ and him crucified. In Romans chapter 15, which is another important uh, series of verses, 
Romans chapter 15, verses 14 through 21. Paul says, I, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all the knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by the way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now you notice he's not drawing attention to himself. He's not drawing attention based on his credentials. Verse 17, In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, to bring to the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Icrelium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel. And thus I will make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. I made a point in Sunday school this morning in reference to knowledge. The fact that we know a lot of stuff, don't we? Well, we know a whole lot of stuff. And the fact that we even know that Jesus Christ came and Jesus Christ lived on this earth, who's God in the flesh, lived on this earth for almost 33 years and then died by crucifixion because of nothing he's done that was wrong. And yet, what, for three days he was in the grave and then he rose from the dead. All of humanity knows that. That's knowledge. But you know where people lack they lack in understanding that knowledge. Why? Because it's not convincing enough to live for God. It's not convincing enough to forsake sin. It's not convincing enough to be obedient to the things of God. For some reason, we think we need more proof. Well, Paul, is, he's responding, he's responding to those who were accusing him falsely. The story is told of one of the predecessors of Franklin Roosevelt, commonly known as FDR. He was the 32nd president of the United States. At official functions at the White House, he often endured long receiving lines, and he found this tiresome and boring. He complained that no one really paid attention to what he, to what he had said. So one day, during a reception, he decided to try an experiment. To each person who passed down the line and shook his hand, he murmured, I murdered my grandmother this morning. The guests responded with phrase like, Marvelous! Keep up the good work! We are so proud of you! God bless you, sir! It was not till the end of the line, while greeting the ambassador from Bolivia, that his words were actually heard. Nonplus, the ambassador leaned over and whispered, I'm sure she had it coming. <laughs> well, that's pretty ruthless, huh? <laughs> but even in a statement like that, you think about it, shouldn't the people have gotten that right off the bat? And in the same way as Paul, and as, you know, preaches those who are truly of the gospel, proclaim the word of God, how many people actually get it and how, how many people actually don't get it? And for the majority's sake, I think most don't get it. They have the knowledge, but they lack understanding. So Paul, as he's continuing to... Despite the, the offensive and, and, and the horrible things and accusations they used against him, he was going to continue to what? Live for God, despite his obstacles. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians and chapter uh, 12. As I was reading that to you in chapter, uh, verse 11, says, he says, Have I been a fool? Of course, you know, again, Paul is not a fool by any means, but if people are going to be foolish enough to listen to false doctrine, 
and be led astray from Christ, you've got to be crazy. But he uses the term fool. And he says, if you want me to be a fool, if you want me to act like them, I'm going to do that. I'm going to show you. That's why he talked about the visions. That's why he talked about the revelation. Because those, those uh, uh, false teachers were priding themselves on themselves. Of course, and on their education. They were getting paid. Paul wasn't getting paid. Paul didn't want to get paid. And they looked at him like he was nuts. Because no one did that. See? So he says, notice, he said, you forced me to it. Not really. For I ought to have been commended by you, which they should have. For why, or I should say for, because I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, these false teachers. That's why he turned them super apostles, because they held them on such a high pedestal. He says, even though I am nothing, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost notice. Patience. Patience meaning remaining under or a bearing up under. With signs and wonders and mighty works. And he did. He did perform that. For in what, for in what were you less favored than the rest of the churches except that I myself did not burden you? Forgive me for this wrong. So, you know, it's like saying to somebody... You know, I went out of my way to help you, and uh, even though you didn't accept it, forgive me for that. That's what he's saying. E even, even, though, even though I went out of my way to serve you and, 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 to, and to live among you at peace and, and, and declare to you the Word of God, you looked at me like I was from another planet. But he says, if you did, he said, I forgive you for that. Because you see what? You had the knowledge, but you lacked understanding. You took up with these false teachers. You believed that their way was successful because after all, the world was lifting them up on a pedestal. Folks, let me just say this. You can be in the biggest mega church in America. But seriously, you could be on your way to hell. And for the life of me, again, when people look at these things and they see these successful mega churches, they're looking at the success that the world brings. Because I know a lot of times people think, well, oh, big boy, they got a big church, they got big ministries, they got all these other, they're doing, they're doing missions work. But maybe you know you read Matthew 24, when Jesus said that there'll be many of them who say to the Lord, didn't we say you were Lord in that day? Didn't we say, didn't we do all these things? And you, you saw what we were doing and everything else. Yeah, you might have been doing all these things, but Jesus said, I don't know you. I never knew you. You see, people can do a lot of great things in life. But their motive is in their own heart. They want to do it for themselves. Paul wasn't thinking that way here. He said, you've seen my life. You've seen how we treated you. You've seen how we loved you and made these sacrifices. And in fact, accusing me of all kinds of other dashly things, which I wasn't doing. What made you think I deserved that? So Paul says, you know what? I'm dealing with immature Christians as an apostle. I cannot disown you any more than God can disown you. And he's going to express that love here in a minute. But he responds with them with godly patience. Secondly, he responds with godly generosity. Paul was unyielding despite oppression, verses 14 through 18. Now, Titus... Paul's going to bring him into the picture, and he's doing that to do this, to cover his tracks. Because you're going to always have those naysayers. You're going to always have people, despite your best efforts, you're going to still have people who are going to slander you. And he knew that. So he was well equipped on how to deal with that. So beginning in verse number 14, as we continue here, he says, For the third time, I am ready to come to you. So he's going to visit them. He wants to sit down and talk to them. He wants to be able to point out some of the things in their life that they're not doing, or they should be doing. And he says, I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours, but what? He says, I seek you. See? It's love for them. It, 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 he wants he want to show this generosity, how generous. And really, the generosity came from the Lord. But he says, for children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. Now, that was a given. 
That was a given. And that was a, that's what parents would do. They'd do the best they could to make sure that the kids were taken care of. And then he says, verse 15, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. You see, the balance here is our souls. And I got to tell you, you know, we, we can't really define too much about what I've never seen a soul before. I've never seen a spirit before. And in the spiritual realm, we're limited in what we can and cannot see. In fact, we can't even see it. We can only appropriate it by faith. So he goes, he talks of something that goes much deeper than human understanding. But then he says, I, I love you more. Now, in that statement right there, it just, it really blesses me. Because when I think about that, I think about you as a parent, those of you who had children, and you grow, watched them grow up, and uh, over a period of time, you know, your love for express for them is mostly in the things that you do. But you, you, but you notice this, your children can never love you as much as you love them. Do you know that? On their best day, they can never love you as much as you love them. This is what Paul's expressing here. I, I, I love them dearly. I, I love them with this godly generosity that, that, that just, that's something you can't work up by yourself. But he says, I love you more. I am to be loved less. That's a rhetorical question. It shouldn't be. After all, he wanted the Christ. After all, their allegiance should be to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to those who uphold the gospel. Why would you do that? Why would you shoot yourself in the foot? And it's just like sometimes I hear, you know, husband and wife, and every now and then a wife will come in there and she'll start complaining about her husband. You are great. I will good for nothing, low down dog. But all the while, here's what they're doing. They're shooting themselves in the foot. You know, or men will do the same thing. My old lady. <laughs> my old lady did this. My old lady didn't do that. All the while, he's shooting himself in the foot. And here they are, putting down Paul, slandering him, saying horrible things about him. But you notice on the words here, his love for them didn't grow cold. That's the generosity of God. That's the kindness of God. That's what God does in the hearts of a believer. Well, what do we want to do, which we don't have to work up, by the way? We get mad, we get angry, and we want to just, what, spit fire. That's not, that doesn't come from the throne of grace. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God that so many people know so little about, yet they say they know him, but they have no understanding of who he really is. And those who follow him, those who serve him, Contrast false teachers against those who proclaim the gospel, a gospel according to the scriptures, not a watered-down gospel, not a universal gospel of believism where people can say, you know what, accept Jesus and you'll never go to hell. But Paul and Titus proved their love for the Corinthians by supporting themselves and not becoming a burden to the church. See, they were working class people. They were hard workers. Unlike the false teachers, they just wanted to exploit them for what they had and live in their, you know, four and five uh, vacation homes in their gold chariots. I don't know if they had gold chariots, but, you know, eating the choice food, Epicurean delight food. You see... And we kind of contrast it today. We look at it, well, it's a contrast today, but we draw a parallel to it today. And the, and the false teachers of today, they're filling up the airwaves on radio. They're filling up the airwaves on TV. And even in these big, huge mega churches, and people are just gobbling that stuff up. Writing books about the revelations they had, writing, writing books about the visions they have. Folks, if Paul was instructed by the Holy Spirit not to say anything about the things that he went through, what do you think about these shysters today? What gives them the liberty to do that? That's why you ought to be careful and be cautious. They got these bookstores now, of course, there's a lot of them dying off because of, you get so much garbage on the Internet. But uh, 
you know, there's books, tons and tons of books that are written. I remember when the last time I went to a Christian bookstore, I saw all these shysters on the shelves in prominent positions. Places where you would just, I mean, it's kind of like an impulse item. You couldn't help but not buy it because of the color and the attraction. Visions and dreams. How to be a powerful Christian. How to live in prosperity. Well, all those. How to be healed. Just send me your money. Send me your seed money. People just open up their wallets and. Whoosh, whoosh. Oh, I didn't get healed. Well, don't say nothing. Just send more money. You didn't have enough faith. See, that's how they start them. But Paul and, and, and Titus, and of course, as the scripture says here, he said, uh, he says, here for the third time I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours, but you, for children are not obligated to say for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, which he, they did, he did, am I to be loved less? But granting that I myself did not burden you, I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit. Did I take advantage of you through any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus to go, notice, and sent the brother with him. So that was for insurance. See, accountability. Did Titus take advantage of you? No. Rhetorical question. Did he, did he not act in the same spirit? As whom? As the apostle? As Paul? Yeah. Did, did he not take the same steps? Sure. To ensure that no one would speak falsely or make false claims about them. Remember when they were taking the money to help those, those poor Christians back in Jerusalem, starving I mean, that would have been a great opportunity to just skim a little bit off the top. See? No. He made sure of that. He covered his tracks. So again, the word burden means to oppress or weigh down or dead weight. Now, just for the sake of the argument here of what we're talking about, it's in this same chapter, I'm sorry, in this same book, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, and I'll read them off real quick to you. Paul says, For our boast is in this, the testimony of our conscience, woo, that we behave in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. See, that was unheard of. That goes against culture. That goes against human reasoning. In chapter 4, verse 2, But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse, you see, by the grace of God, you can refuse this. Cunning, to practice cunning, or to tamper with God's word. And what do we have these false teachers doing? They pick and choose what they want. Cherry picking the word of God. Eliminating things and adding to things. Kind of like one of our representatives in the house. We want to make the story up as we go along. All we want to do is present you with the facts. Forget about the truth. Oh, if I got enough facts, that's going to convince you, right? That's what they say. If I got enough facts to prove where I'm coming from, then that's acceptable, right? Why? Because you're so intelligent. But wait a minute. What happened to the truth? That's what you got to ask yourself. What happened to the truth? And remember what Jesus said? Thy word is truth. This is the truth. This is the only source of truth. So if whatever you're using in life to prism through, to filter through, if it's other than the word of God, you can't trust it. Uh, 7 2, chapter 7, verse 2. Paul says, make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. So make it clear. He says, we're not out to exploit you. You see this by our own lives. You see by example how we're living in front of you. And then chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. 
He says, I beg you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who, was, who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we all live in this body, we are not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but notice, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We have the Word of God today. So, when I'm speaking to you across the pulpit, you got a Bible in front of you. You can cross-examine me whether I'm telling you the truth or not. Paul's telling them the same thing. He said, look, you can cross-examine me by the Scriptures, but let me, just, let me just take it another step. Look at my life. That's what Paul's saying. Just look at my life. Look at the life that I'm living. Look, look, at what I, look where my focus is. Look where my motive is. Look at the things that I'm, I'm passionate about. I rest my case. So Paul making that next push concerning his response towards those who were of, the, of those who loved, supposedly supposed to have loved him, brothers and sisters in Christ. He makes his next appeal, his response with God and love. I made a little bit of effort to share that with you, but Paul was noticed unyielding despite their apathy. You know, you think about that. You think about if a person truly loves you, you think they're going to be mediocre in their life? You know, those of you who are married, you know this. Uh, if somebody just sits around in the house all day long and watches soap operas, what does that say about love? <laughs> I don't know if they get any, any remark from that, but, you know, for the most part, you think about it. What is love? What is, love's an action word. And love should, su 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 should, success, should suggest this. Uh... It's done in word and also what? Deed. That's what love is done in. Now you draw the balance. I would tell you, I would just venture to say this. Your action speaks louder than what? Yeah. So despite how Paul saw their, their pathetic situation that they were in, and despite the fact that even though it was these false teachers, you know, a lot of times we want to blame other people for the problems we have in our life. Y'all not one of those people here, huh? Yeah. <laughs> It's this woman that you left with me, God, that caused me to do all these crazy... Oh, there's this man in here. If it wouldn't be for this man... Y'all know, know that's old like the hill, right? <clears throat> well, they couldn't lay claim to that because Paul could see right through them. He knew where they were coming from. So despite the fact, in, in, let's go back to the Scriptures here in 2 Corinthians and, and uh, pick up in verse 19. He says, have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It really was not, I mean, it was a rhetorical question. There was, there was no need to. He says, it is in the sight of notice, God, that we have been speaking in Christ. So, in other words, he's saying, listen, God knows. He sees my heart, my heart and he knows where I'm at. And is after all, you're building up, of all your building Upbuilding, beloved. In other words, he spent time building them up in the faith, encouraging them, do the right thing, live for Christ, you know, coming alongside them. Verse 24, fear that perhaps that when I come, I will find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish. That perhaps there may be quarreling, notice, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. So, a couple of things here. When we talked about this, and it's, it, just, I'm going to use this little illustration to lead into this. There was a man watching TV when all of a sudden a mouse ran underneath the set. The man got up and went out to his shed and came back with a mouse trap. He then went to the fridge to get some cheese, but there was no cheese. So he did what he thought was the next best thing. He got a hold of a magazine that had colorful ads in it. He cut out a picture of cheese and put it in the mousetrap. And when he went to bed, he woke up the next morning, he immediately checked the mousetrap. Lo and behold, I'm not going to tell you what really happened here. You won't believe this. He found a picture of a mouse from the same magazine stuck in the trap. 
Moral of the story, if you want to catch the real thing, you've got to put out the real thing. <laughs> Moral of this story, if you want people to understand, especially God's people, you're going to have to stick with the text. Because people are going to continue to be confused about life and its measures. Well, despite that, the two types of sins that are mentioned are the same two areas of sins false teachers would allow to go unchecked in their church. That's what false teachers do. In other words, I have this great big mega church. You're going to have to be looking the other way when the members are living in sin. Social sins, verse 20, I just read that to you. And in verse 21, there were sexual sins. Those are the two. He says, verse 21, I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, and I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned early and have not repented. Repented, in other words, changed their way about their attitude towards these sins of impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have, notice, practice. You see, they were living that way in the church, all the while saying, I'm a believer. God loves me. I can live the kind of life I want to live. Well, Paul's saying, wait a minute, look, I love you enough to tell you what is true. And if you keep on believing that, then guess what? It shouldn't be a guess. You're going to have to be held accountable for that. Just like any good parent would tell their children, little Jimmy, little Sally, if you do this, here's the consequences. Every parent should do that. If a parent wouldn't do that, what would happen? You'd be raising a criminal. If a parent wouldn't tell their children what is true about this life, there are consequences, good ones and bad ones. You make those choices. Remember, a child hasn't experienced the world. Like some would say, oh, i got to go make my own mistakes. I said it. Really? <laughs> That's a, I was a fool to think that. That was the, the philosophy of the world. you got to go make your own mistakes to experience the life, this life, this glorious life outside the home. Seriously? And I told that, that young man the other day, I said, you know, the fact that there's never been a teenager or a young person ever come to me and said, I want to be a failure in life. Never. I mean, that doesn't make sense, does it? That's an oxymoron. Why would you want to fail in life? But all the while, people do that, right? You know what success is in life? Knowing God and walking with Him. Someone once told me that. Read Joshua 1.8. Knowing God and walking with Him. That's being a successful life. You'd be hanging on the back of a garbage truck, but people would look at that and say, that's not successful. Well, who are you to look at that and say it's not successful? If that person's walking with God and doing the best that he can and going to church and being with church and his family, with his family, why are you sitting back and taking judgment towards that person saying, that's not successful? See, we always draw conclusions, what? From outward. But God looks at the heart of a person, and he knows exactly what's going on in that time bomb up here. Uh, let's just turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse, beginning of verse 1. I love these little epistles, because it's just rich in the doctrine of the faith. Verse 1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What he's saying here is you don't have to live that life of misery, of sin. Why? Because of what Christ has done. And as God's children, you shouldn't be living that way, practicing that kind of life. Yes, God still loves you. His love for you won't diminish. And thank God, because he doesn't think like a man. But notice, but verse 3, but sexual immorality and impurity of co or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. So for a Christian to be living with another woman 
in the house and they're not married, that's fornication, in the eyes of the Lord, that's wrong. And I've heard the excuses, well, you know, she, uh, she didn't have a place to live, or he didn't have a place to live, and, uh, but we're not having sexual relations. I hear those arguments. But you know what Timothy, uh, it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 10, says, let, don't even give a fragrance or even a, a smidgen of that kind of language to a person of evil. Even though you say that it all oh, is for, it's for, you know, it's just to help the person out. It's wrong according to the Word of God. And, and today, I, I see a lot of young people today and older people, you know, and, and for whatever reason, they might even attest to, but they say they're Christians, right? This is for the people who say they are born-again believers. For the unbelievers, they can, you can go live as much as you want like that. That's up to you. I'm not telling you to do it, but if that's what you choose to do, go ahead. But you're going to reap the consequences of that sin. And you'll be judged for it, not by me, but by God. Because why? You're already judged by God. And if that's what brings happiness to your life and joy to your life, I don't know what chapter and verse you read in the Bible, but that's not from my Bible. So he's saying, don't, don't, don't let this even be mentioned among you for this reason, because you are a child of the living God. You are a saint. You belong to God. So he says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking. And you know how we're drawn to that kind of stuff, even though we're Christians? Yeah. Yeah. My flesh loves it just as much as yours does. But should I participate in that? But I'll say no. Which, notice, which are out of place. It's unbecoming. It's not of the nature of a believer who's in Christ. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. See, I can give thanks for what the election results. Amen? I can rejoice in the results of the election. Thank you, Lord. You see, I don't have to go around and start criticizing and complaining. But that's, you see, again, that's the flesh. That's the carnal side of Tony. And boy, I don't have to work that kind of stuff up. Verse 5, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually moral or impure, who is covetous, that is, an adulterer, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, I didn't say this. This is from the Word of God. If people who live a life immorally, who practice any kind of sexuality, impure sexuality, sexuality outside of God's restrictions, out of God's, really, grace, you know, it has its intent purposes, God designed it that way, but not outside of His perimeters. Every one of you have a liberty. You can choose. You can choose to live the way you want to live. But does it make it right? Is it right in the eyes of your Creator? And that's who you must look at. Now I want you to turn. I won't read all, all the 16 verses, but I want you to turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. And here's that verse. Abstain from every form of evil. In other words, he says, have, have not, don't even give a hint that you're living a life that's immoral. And for whatever just causes you may attach to that, it doesn't make it right. Does that, does that make, does that, is that understanding? I mean, does that make sense? See, I, I'm, I'm, just follow, I'm just following the text of the Word here. 
I don't even have to make any, expound on any kind of unpacking here. I just, just read it as it comes. Verse 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. And you say, well, Brother Tony, I'm struggling. <laughs> Amen. I'll be the first one to raise my hand. I'm struggling, just like you, maybe even worse. I don't know. But I'm not here to compare notes or see what how bad your struggles are and my struggles. We're all struggling as Christians. Sin is a, is, a, is a culprit. It lives, like Paul said in Romans chapter 7. He says, the things I want to do, I can't do. And the things I don't want to do, I want to do. Well, that sounds kind of confused, doesn't it? He sounds like a confused man. He sounds like he needs a counselor. But he already had the Holy Council. He had the Holy Spirit living in him. You see, it's trying to make sense of something that you already know is the problem between you and God. And it's sin. I didn't say sins, folks. I said sin. S-I-N. That's the culprit. That's at the root. That's the problem. That's why we struggle. That's why Paul's saying, I struggle. He says, O wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from what this body of death? Body of death, body of sin. You see? Now, only God, and that's a, that's a mystery, only God could choose to do this. Forgive somebody from all their sins. And then, not only forgive them, but place His Holy Spirit within them. And I'm going to tell you, that's, that should bring about dynamic change. <laughs> You know, what it, you know what it says to me? It says, for the first time in my life, I'm able to say, I hate my sin. For the first time. Not today, of course. I've said it before. But I'm just saying, as a result of the Holy Spirit coming to live in your life, you will find this. You'll start hating your sin. Because here's what happens. He comes into your life and changes you. You don't just turn over a new leaf. You just don't find some religion. You don't just, you know... Some people say, oh, you got to turn Jesus, turn Jesus freak on us. He needed a crutch. Let me just say this. I was de desperately wicked, and I didn't even know it. Until what? Until God showed me I needed a Savior. Oh. You don't know, I know most of you know this, but you, we're so blessed. Our socks should fly right off our feet. We're so blessed. It's beyond measure. We can't fully comprehend. And, and as Paul's trying to relate to these dear brothers and sisters in Christ, as much as they, as much as they even turn to hatred towards him. Now, you know, how can, how can that, that's, a, that's another oxymoron. How can a Christian hate another Christian? You, don't need, to, you need to read 1 John. How in the world can another Christian hate another Christian? That would be like saying, man, I hate my big foot so bad I'm going to cut it off. Y'all know how crazy that is, right? But, but that's exactly what's happening. We see this happening in our public forum, within our Congress, in our Senate, all the way up to the President, all the way down to our grassroots. We have... And, and look, many of them profess to be Christians. And they have that bitter hatred towards one another. Oh, I don't buy this whole thing about this politics. No, 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 no. Truth will prevail. When it comes to people and what they say and what they do and how they live their lives, it says a great deal about their love and affection for Jesus Christ. Because when the God of this universe comes to live without, within your heart, there is definite change. And why would you have so much hatred towards your brother and sister in Christ? We have that going on over here. Not in this church, but I know some churches where it came from. And to this day, got some of my friends who say they're Christian and have bitter hatred towards me. What did I do to them? Nothing. But that's just the nature of the beast. You see, 
until you know what it means to live outside of God's will, this is the kind of person you become. You become like your father the devil. And your father the devil believes in living nothing but lies, destruction, murder. Why do you think we still have murdering babies as a popular episode today in this country? It hadn't blinked. Y'all thought it blinked, right? Y'all thought it was going to be changed, right? It's still on the books. They're still murdering babies, taking body parts and selling them. But you see, let it not be said among Christians that one of you would put your child, your grandbaby, on the altar of Moloch for the sake of the economy so people can have a job. Well, Paul's wanting his Christians, these, these believers, to understand this, that without the Lord, we are left to ourselves. So there has to be something for us to draw from this, okay? So I gave you three points. Number one, my challenge for you today. Now, tomorrow might be different. Sanat fat. That's something else. But today, here's your challenge. God's patience instead of your own. You know, extend that, extend that same patience towards others that you would want or you would expect from them, right? In other words, give people a lot of slack. And that's exactly what Paul was doing. He's given them a lot of room to get corrected. But what is he using? He's using the Word of God. You see, he didn't want to go knocking on their door. He didn't want to go snooping in to see what they were doing at home. He simply took the Word of God and he said, now you've got to deal with it. As a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. There must be something about you that needs to change. So with that same expressed patience that he's shown towards them, for them to change, and by that time they started changing. However, there were still some of those false teachers in those churches exploiting those Christians. He says, use the same patience towards others. But remember where that patience comes from. It comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from you. And then what else? God's generosity as a substitute of your own. Become less burdensome to others by not demanding anything in return. Boy, if every Christian would see that. You see, that phileo love is I scratch your back and you scratch mine. That's, that's within Christians. When the only love you and I are supposed to express towards one, one another is agape love. You know what agape love is? Huh? It's the love that God loves you with. It says this, I don't, there's, not a one, there's not one thing that you have or that you do that I want. That's, a, that's freedom. I don't have to love you. Listen, I don't have to love you based on what you do for me. I can just simply love you for who you are. No matter how dirt poor you are, no matter how lack of intelligence you might have, no matter what kind of car you drive, no matter what kind of clothes you wear, I can still love you and accept you just the way you are. Hallelujah. That's freedom, folks. But you see, again, we try to work that up. We make a futile attempt to try to live a life outside of the Lord. You can't do it. He says that in John 15, 5. He said, you can do nothing without me. But we see, I know. We, 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 I got that. I got that, God. I, I, I got it. No, you don't. Why do you think Paul kept talking about his weaknesses? Because he knew who to depend on. He had to get out of the way. He had to recognize, even though he was a brilliant man, he was a very knowledgeable man. You couldn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a guy like that. He'd take, you'd take all them lawyers over there in Congress, he'd put them all to shame. All at the same time. <laughs> but he didn't want to be a burden to anybody. That's freedom in that, folks. And then thirdly here this morning, we're going to finish here. God's love for others as a replacement of your own. Be more willing to lovingly share with others the truth that comes from God's Word. And again, I come back to the part about parenting. 
you don't, you would not love your children if you would not tell them the truth. You would. And I know there's a temptation sometimes for some parents because they feel like if they tell their children the truth, they're not going to love them anymore. But you see, that's, re that's resting on your own understanding. In fact, just the opposite will happen. You don't tell them the truth, they'll drive further away from you. In fact, they will hold animosity towards you for not telling them the truth. So the very thing you think by not telling the truth has an adverse effect. Totally opposite. That's why Paul wasn't afraid to tell them what was true. Because he knew. I know, I know there's a temptation for some pastors that would do that because of this reason. They don't want to lose membership. They don't want to lose money. See? If I, tell, if I start, if start preaching against sin, guess what? I'm going to lose membership. I'm going to lose money. I'm going to miss out on my bonuses. You see? See how that works? But you see, it's not up to me. It, it's not up to you. Who's it up to? The Lord Almighty. He changes people. He gives people an abiding a relationship with an invitation that says, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. You're struggling right now today? I got great news for you. The Lord will give you peace. But you've got to come to Him. You must understand that you're a sinner. You must understand that He went to the cross for your sins. He paid that price. But you've got to bow your heart to Him. He's Lord. It's not that you make Him Lord of your life. He's already Lord. But you repent. You put your faith and trust in Him. He will forgive you of your sins. Clean you up. Forever. What does he do? He gives you his righteousness so that you can go to heaven. But you can't do it based on your own way of doing it. You must come to him. You must go through the cross. Jesus said, there's no other way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. There's only one mediator between God and man. It's the man Christ Jesus. This is not confusing, but it's so hard, especially when sin has calloused your heart. And the love, the love of God, remember, it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. It's the kindness of God. It's God's love for you. That it's not His will that any should perish, but that all should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth in the righteous, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9, 10. You cannot go, go to heaven. You cannot receive salvation outside of Jesus Christ. So you have, to, you have to humble yourself. And you, and you know what? Sometimes that's hard to do too. You know what you do? You ask God. And He gives the grace. He does. All right, we're going to take